Greetings, Sephira, said Arya, and twisted her hand over her chest <laughs> in the elves' gesture of respect. Fucking musical edition. <laughs> hey, how's it going, you fiends? I'm dead inside. And I'm Demi Bobemi. And welcome back to another Brisinger <laughs> who got fucked up, because I sure did. I did it. <laughs> Why are you so nervous? I don't know, because you always do it. I don't do it. You anything. have, like, your own YouTube channel. Where you say your own intro. Yeah, but that's different. And it's just me just playing around and having a fun time. This isn't playing around and having a fun time? Yeah, but it feels real. <laughs> like, serious. Fuck. Like, not, like, <laughs> serious, like, we're not having fun. It just feels like, I don't know. Like, it's a whole production. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> we got wires hanging. We got a fucking cloud lifter on the ground. Okay. Cloud lifter on the ground. Okay. Cloud lift. On the okay, ground. Listen, I just sit at <laughs> my get computer. It? Yeah, I get it. Like everything about that cloud lift on the ground. I get is it. Just redunculous. Listen to my words. I just sit at my little computer desk with like and bebop. And just bebop they around got, like, with these, like, like hot cheese. You got these like phallic everywhere. looking microphones in front of you that look high quality and are metal. Yeah, it's pretty true. I use like a twenty dollar mic. <laughs> Because my Blue Yeti doesn't work. You could use a black blue. blue, blue. <laughs> wow. Short circuit. You could use the black blue Yeti. That was like when you try to read a color that's in a different word. Like it's actually colored yellow, but you're trying to read the word red. Oh, yeah. Me trying to say black blue Yeti. <laughs> Black, black blue Yeti. Banana, black blue Yeti. Banana, banana. <laughs> okay. And welcome back to another <laughs> Basinger. Um, last time on Brisinger. Aragon talked to Nazawada. Nazawada said, you want to go to Farzandur and like see who's going to be the king? Aragon threw a fit and said, no, I don't want to. Nazawada said, you have to because I'm telling you to. And she spanked him. And <laughs> <laughs> And then they said, okay, I guess we'll go, but Saphira's <laughs> going to stay behind. And then Aragorn said, yeah, but then Saphira can come later and fix the jewel, and then we're going to go to Elis Mira. She Nos spanked him again. <laughs> and Naswada spanked him again <laughs> and was like, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dude, that was the best recap I think I've, I think Isaac's ever heard. Look at him. It put him right to sleep. <laughs> He's fucking unconscious. It was so good. Dude, that's why we need the puppy cam to catch Isaac sleeping. They're so cute. Maybe next time. Next time, now that I have that fucking USB thing, <clears throat> we could actually hook up the webcam into that USB. Oh wait, no, you can't. Chapter twenty-six: Footprints of Shadow. You gonna laugh wow. about that? <laughs> I was just thinking, like, <laughs> it just sounds like <clears throat> such like nonsensical, weird, whatever. Like, uh, what's that? game called shadows may die twice and it's just like shadows die twice or whatever i don't know <clears throat> with a series of giddy leaps zephira carried aragon through the camp to roran and katrina's tent outside the tent katrina was washing a shift in a bucket of soapy water scrubbing the white fabric against a board of rigid wood she lifted a hand to shield her eyes as a cloud of dust from zephira's landing drifted over her <laughs> fucking dick <laughs> <laughs> roran stepped out of the tent Buckling on his belt, he coughed and squinted in the dust. What brings you here, he asked, as Aragon dismounted. <laughs> I love how it's like probably not angry at all. He's just like, what brings you here? Hey, how's it going? What brings you here? But I'm like, what brings you here, you fucking little twerp? Where's your fedora? <laughs> Speaking quickly, Aragon told him of his impeding departure and impressed upon them the importance of keeping his absence a secret from the rest of the villagers. No matter how slighted they feel because I supposedly refuse to see them, you cannot reveal the truth to them, not even Horst or Elaine. Let them think I have become a rude and ungrateful lout before you so much as utter a word about Nalaswada's scheme. This I ask of you, for the sake of everyone who has pitted themselves against the Empire. Will you do it? We would never betray you, Aragon, said Katrina. Of that, you need have no doubts. Then, Roran said that he too was leaving. Where? exclaimed Aragon. I just received my assignment a few minutes ago. We were going to raid the Empire's supply trains. Somewhere well north of us, behind enemy lines. Aragon gazed at the three of them in turn, 
First Roran, serious and determined, already tense with anticipation of battle. Then Katrina, worried and trying to conceal it. And then Zephira, whose nostrils flick flickered with small tongues of flame, which sputtered as she breathed. So we are all going our separate ways. What he did not say, but which hung over them like a shroud, was that they might never see each other alive. We might never, they might, was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was that they might never again see each other alive. Oof. I mean, probably some of them are going to see each other alive again. So I'm not worried well, like, about it. But Safir like, and Katrina are going their separate ways. Like they could hang out. Yeah, they could like chill together. Grasping Aragon by the forearm. Well, I guess not really to keep up the ruse of yeah, Aragon. Being, yeah. <clears throat> Grasping Aragon by the forearm, Roran pulled him close and hugged him for a moment. He released Aragon and stared deep into his eyes. Guard your back, brother. Gobbatorx isn't the only one who would like to slip a knife between your ribs when you aren't looking. Do the same yourself. And if you find yourself facing a spellcaster, run in the opposite direction. The wards I placed around you won't last forever. Katrina hugged Aragon and whispered, don't take too long. Also, did you place wards around me? <laughs> <laughs> what about me, though? Oops. I won't. Together, Roran and Katrina went to Safira and touched their foreheads to her long, bony snout. Her chest vibrated as she produced a pure bass note deep within her throat. <laughs> 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 like Inception, like... <laughs> I just imagine them like s like smacking their foreheads like to her when they're like, <laughs> <laughs> it just seemed like, like I know what he's trying to say, but it seemed like weird and unnatural at first. I just imagine them just like, and then <laughs> <laughs> remember Warren, she said, do not make the mistake of leaving your enemies alive. And Katrina do not dwell on that, which you cannot change. It'll only worsen your str distress. With a rustle of skin and scales, Safira unfolded her wings and enveloped Rar and Katrina and Aragon in a warm embrace, isolating them from the world. Cute. It's a dragon <laughs> hug. And then she killed them. And then she <laughs> ate them. <laughs> As Safira lifted her wings, Rar and Katrina stepped away while Aragon climbed onto her back. He waved at the newlywed couple, a lump in his throat, and continued waving even as Safira took to the air. Blinking to clear his eyes, Aragon leaned against the spike behind him and gazed up at the tilting sky. To the cook tents now, as Safira? Aye. Safira climbed a few hundred feet before she aimed herself at the southwestern quadrant of the camp, where pillars of smoke drifted up from rows of ovens and large, wide pit fires. A thin stream of wa wind slipped past her and Aragon as she glided downward toward a clear patch of ground between two open-walled tents, each fifty feet long. Breakfast was over, so the tents were empty of men, when Safira landed with a loud thump. Aragon hurried toward the fires beyond the plank tables, Safira beside him. The many hundreds of men who were busy tending the fires, carving meat, cracking eggs, kneading dough, stirring cast iron kettles full of mysterious liquids, scrubbing clean enormous piles of dirty pots and pans, and who were otherwise engaged in the enormous and never-ending task of preparing food for the Varden did not pause to gawk at Aragon and Sephira. For what importance was a dragon rider comp compared with the merciless demands? For what was the importance of a dragon rider Yikes, I, Isaac, you're distracting me from your adorable, cute puppy dreams. <laughs> or with your adorable, cute puppy dreams. Look at him. I know. He's, he's so cute. cute, his old mouth. He just went. For what importance was a dragon and rider compared with the merciless demands of the ravenous, mini-mouthed creature whose hunger they were striving to sate? The Varden. <laughs> and you said many? I was like, I, <laughs> you said it like, many? And so I was thinking like miniature, oh. like the mini mouth. And I they was said like, like a mini mouth creature <laughs> know, over like, there. What the fuck? Like but throwing food at it and won't <laughs> stop eating instead of the Varden. <laughs> a stout man with a close cropped beard of white and black, who was almost short enough to pass for a dwarf, trotted over to Aragon and Sephira and gave a curt bow. I'm Quoth Marinson. How can I help you? If you want Shade Slayer, we have some bread that just finished baking. He gestured toward a double row of sourdough loaves resting on a platter on a nearby table. I might have half a loaf, if you can spare it, said Aragon. However, 
My hunger isn't the reason for our visit. Sephira would like something to eat, and we haven't time for her to hunt, as she usually does. Quoth looked past him and eyed Sephira's bulk, and his face grew pale. How much does she normally, uh, that is, how much do you normally eat, Sephira? I can have six sides of roast beef brought over immediately, and another six will be ready in about fifteen minutes. Will that be enough, or? The knob in his throat jumped as he swallowed. Sephira emitted a soft, rippling growl, which caused Quoth to squeak and hop backward. He squeaked? <laughs> <laughs> you know? like Little mousy boy. Little fucking... Yeah, he is. He's <laughs> short, too. He's a little fucking mousy boy crawling through the walls looking for cheese. <laughs> she would prefer a live animal if that's convenient, Aragon said. In a high-pitched voice, Quoth said, Convenient? Oh, yes, it's convenient. He bobbed his head, twisting as his apron... He bobbed his head twisting at his apron with his greased-stained hands. Most convenient indeed, Shadeslayer. Dragon Sephira, King Orin's table will not be lacking this afternoon, then. Oh, no. And a barrel of mead, Sephira said to Aragon. <laughs> Fuck yeah. She's trying to get turnt. She's like, if you're leaving, I'm depressed. I'm drinking. White circles appeared around Quoth's irises as Aragon repeated her request. I, I'm afraid that the dwarves have purchased most of our stocks of m- m- mead, we have only a few barrels left, and those are reserved for King Orin flinched as a four-foot-long flame leaped out of Sephira's nostrils and singed the grass in front of him. And singed the grass in front of him. Snarled lines of smoke drifted up from the blackened stalks. I, I, I will have a barrel brought to you at once. If you will f- follow me, I will t- t- take you to the livestock, where you may, b- may have whatever beast you like. Sephira's a bully. I was just gonna say, like, okay, look, bitch. We are in this civilized environment it's been reserved there's no fucking mead for you you don't have to burn him alive she's like i'll just scare him a little she's like dragon get what dragon want <laughs> <clears throat> skirting the fires and the tables and groups of harried men or hairy men the cook <laughs> led them to a collection of large wooden pens which contained pigs cattle geese goats sheep rabbits and a number of wild deer the varden's <laughs> foragers had captured during their forays in the surrounding wilderness Close to the pens were coops full of chickens, ducks, doves, quail, grouse, and other birds. Their squawking, chirping, cooing, and crowing formed a cacophony so harsh it made Aragon grit his teeth with annoyance. Yeah, like the fucking Minecraft farms where all the fucking sheep and cows <laughs> and chickens. Like, dude, it's like, shut the fuck up. You just turn the volume down. <clears throat> turn them down. <laughs> Kill them. <laughs> In order to avoid being overwhelmed by the thoughts and feelings of so many creatures, he was careful to keep his mind closed to all but Sephira. The three of them stopped over a hundred feet from the pen, so Sephira's presence would not panic the imprisoned animals. Is there any here catches your fancy? Quoth asked, gazing up at her and rubbing his hands with nervous dexterity. As she surveyed the pen, Sephira sniffed and said to Aragon, What pitiful prey. I'm really not that hungry, you know. I went hunting only the day before yesterday, and I'm still digesting the bones of the deer I ate. You're still growing quickly. The food will do you good. Not if I can't stomach it. Pick something small, then. A pig, maybe. That would hardly be of any help to you. No, I'll take that one. From Sephira, Aragon received the image of a cow of medium stature with a splattering of white spotches on her left flank. Don't care. After Aragon (laughs) pointed out the cow, Quoth shouted at a line of men idling by the pens. Two of them separated the cow from the rest of the herd, slipped a rope over its head, and pulled the reluctant animal towards Sephira. Thirty feet from... Thirty feet from Sephira, the cow balked and lowered with terror and tried to shake free of the rope and flee. Before the animal could escape, Sephira pounced, leaping across the distance, separating them. The two men who were pulling on the rope threw themselves flat as Sephira rushed toward them, her jaws gaping. I just imagine like a raptor or something. Yeah. I like that visual, that mental image. It was a good mental image, but like, this is making me sad. Bye bye, cow. I mean, just, like, the fact that it's, like, pinned up and it's, like, not having a good life and it's not happy. Dude, it's having the best life it could have. Yeah, but it's not, though. It's just, like, standing in a crowded little pen and then it's, like, drug out by its neck when it's scared and then it gets eaten. By Sephira, a dragon of all things. Yeah. What a terrifying way to go. Makes me sad. Sephira struck the cow broadside as it turned to run, knocking the animal over and holding it in place with her splayed feet. 
It uttered a single, terrified bleat before Safira's jaws closed it over its neck. With the ferocious shake of her head, she snapped its spine. She paused then, crouched low over her kill, and looked expectantly at Aragon. Closing his eyes, Aragon reached out with his mind toward the cow. The animal's consciousness had already faded into darkness, but its body was still alive, its flesh thrumming with emotive energy, which was all the more intense for the fear that had coursed through it moments before. Repugnance for what he was about to do filled Aragon, but he ignored it, and placing a hand over the bell belt of Beloth the Wise transferred the energy he could from the body of the cow into the twelve diamonds hidden around his waist. The process took only a few seconds. He nodded to Sephira. I'm done. Aragon thanked the men for their assistance, and then the two of them left him and Sephira alone. While Sephira gorged herself, Aragon sat against the barrel of mead and watched the cooks go about their business. Every time they or one of their assistants beheaded a chicken, or cut the throat of a pig, or a goat, or any other animal, he transferred the energy from the dying animal into the belt of Beloth the Wise. It was grim work, for most of the animals were still aware when he touched their consciousness, and the howling storm of their fear and confusion and pain battered at him until his heart pounded and sweat beat at his brow, and he wished nothing more than to heal the suffering creatures. However, he knew it was their doom to die, lest the Varden would starve. He had depleted the reserve of energy during the past few battles, and Aragon wanted to replenish it before setting out on a long and potentially hazardous journey. If Nazawada had allowed him to remain at the Varden for another week, he could have stocked the diamonds with energy from his own body, and still had time to recuperate before running to Farthendor, but he could not in the few hours he had. And even if he had done nothing but lie in bed and pour the fire from his limbs into the gems, he would not have been able to garner as much force as he did from the multitude of animals. The diamonds of the Belt of Bell at the Y seemed to be able to absorb an almost unlimited amount of energy, so he stopped when he was unable to bear the prospect of immersing himself in the death throes of another animal. Shaking and dripping with sweat from head to toe, he leaned forward, his hands on his knees, and gazed at the ground between his feet, struggling not to be ill. Memories not his own intruded upon his thoughts, memories of Sephira soaring over Leona Lake with him on her back, of them plunging into the clear, cool water, a cloud of white bubbles swarming past them, of their shared delight in flying and swimming and playing together. His breathing calmed, and he looked at Sephira while she sat among the remnants of her kill, chewing on the cow's skull. He smiled and sent her his gratitude for her help. We can go now, he said. <clears throat> Swallowing, she replied. Take my strength as well. You may need it. No. This is one argument you will not win. I insist, and I insist otherwise. I won't leave you here weakened and unfit for battle. What if Murtag and Thorn attack later today? We both need to be ready to fight at any moment. You'll be in more danger than I will because Galbatorix and the whole of the Empire will still believe I'm with you. Yes, but you will still be alone with a coal in the middle of the wilderness. I am as accustomed to the wilderness as you. Being away from civilization does not frighten me. As for a coal, well, I don't know if I could beat one at a wrestling match, but my words will protect me from any treachery. I have enough energy, Sephira. You don't need to give me more. She eyed him, what? considering his words, then lifted a paw and started licking it clean of blood. Very well. I will keep myself. To myself? The corners of her mouth seemed to lift with amusement. Lowering her paw, she said, Would you be so kind as to roll that barrel over to me? With a grunt, he got to his feet and did as she asked. She extended a single talon and punched two holes in the top of the barrel, which released a sweet smell of apple honey mead. It's basically just a sizer saying. <laughs> you uncultured swine. <laughs> Arching her neck so her head was directly above the barrel, she grasped it between her massive jaws, then lifted it skyward and poured the gurgle, gurgle, gurgling contents down her gullet. The empty barrel shattered against the ground when she dropped it, and one of the iron hoops rolled several yards away. Her upper lip wrinkled. Sephira shook her head, then her breath hitched, and she sneezed so hard her nose struck the ground, and a gout of fire erupted from both her mouth and nostrils. Aragon yelped with surprise and jumped sideways, batting at the smoking hem of his tunic. The right side of his face felt seared raw by the heat of the fire. Sephira, be more careful, he exclaimed. Oops. <laughs> she lowered her head and rubbed her dust-caked snout against the edge of one foreleg, scratching at her nostrils. The mead tickles. Really, you ought to know better by now, he grumbled as he climbed onto her back. After rubbing her snout against her foreleg once more, Sephira leapt high into the air, and gliding over the Varden's camp, returned Aragon to his tent. <laughs> Could you imagine if every time you sneezed, <clears throat> the like, fire came out? 
every like Everything's so much de- yeah every everything would be destroyed like when i was making breakfast this morning <laughs> at, <sighs> <laughs> calm down isaac <laughs> he was scared there was fire he slid off her then stood up looking up at safira for a time they said nothing allowing their shared emotions to speak for them safira blinked and he thought her eyes glistened more than normal like she was gonna cry Aww. This is a test, she said. If we pass it, we shall be stronger for it as dragon and rider. And if we don't pass it, we'll die. That's the only <laughs> options. We must be able to function by ourselves if necessary, else we will forever be at a disadvantage compared with others. Yes, she gouged the earth with her clenching claws. Knowing that does nothing to ease my pain, however. A shiver ran the length of her sinuous body. She shuffled her wings. May the wind rise under your wings and the sun always be at your back. Travel well and travel fast, little one. Goodbye, he said. Aragon felt that if he remained with her any longer, he would never leave. So he whirled around and without a backward glance plunged into the dark interior of his tent. The connection between them, which had become as integral to them as the structure of his own flesh, he severed completely. Hmm. They, would seem, they would soon be too far apart to sense, each other's, to sense each other's minds anyway, and he had no desire to prolong the agony of their parting. He stood where he was for a moment, gripping at the hilt of the falchion and swaying as if he were dizzy. Already the dull ache of loneliness suffused him, and he felt small and isolated without the comforting presence of Saphira's consciousness. I did this before, and I can do this again, he thought, and forced himself to square his shoulders and lift his chin. From underneath his cot, he removed the pack he had made during his trip from Hellgrind. Into it, he placed a carved wood tube wrapped in cloth that contained the scroll of the poem he had written for the Agetti blood realm, which Ormus had copied for him in the finest calligraphy, the flask of enchanted fail nerve, and the small soapstone box of Nelgask, which were also gifts from Ormus, and the thick book, Domia Abrawirda, which was Jode's present, his whetstone and his strop, his wet stone and his strop, and after some hesitation, the many pieces of his armor, for he reasoned, <clears throat> if the occasion arises... If the occasion arises where I need it, I will be more happy to have it than I will be miserable carrying it all the way to Farthendur, or so he hoped. The book and the scroll he took because, after having done so much traveling, he had concluded that the best way to avoid losing the objects he cared about was to keep them with him wherever he went. The only extra clothes he decided to bring were a pair of gloves, which he stuffed inside his helmet, and his heavy woolen cloak in case it got cold when they stopped nights. When... Wait, what? (laughs) In case it got cold when they stopped nights. All the rest, he left rolled up in Sephira's saddlebags. If I really am a member of Dirk Gremston Jeetum, he thought, they will clothe me properly when I arrive at Bregenhold. Cinching up the pack, he lay, I mean, you could also just magic some clothes. Nah, he is entitled to gifts from everyone everywhere he goes. He is a rider. Yeah, he's entitled. You could just go, I am a rider. <laughs> Gift me a fedora. <laughs> Cinching off his pack, he lay his unstrung bow and quiver across the top and lashed them to the frame. He was about to do the same with the falchion when he realized that if he leaned to the side, the sword could slide out of the sheath. Therefore, he tied the sword flat against the rear of his pack, angling it so the hilt would ride between his neck and right shoulder, where he could still draw it if need be. Like a katana. <laughs> fucking weeaboo. What a weeb. Why doesn't he just dual wield like a fucking badass? He should just get a second katana. It's not a katana. It's a joke. I saw someone like was so mad that we were calling it a katana. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, how dare you like. How dare you describe a falchion, a fucking pinnacle of blades as a katana. They're like a stupid weeb stick. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down, people. Half the time we're not even serious about anything. Aragon donned the pack and then stabbed through the barrier in his mind, feeling the energy surging in his body. And in the 12 diamonds mounted on the belt, a bell out the wise. Tapping into the flow of force, he murmured the spell he had cast but once before. That which bent rays of light around him and rendered him invisible. A slight pall of fatigue weakened his limbs as he released the spell. He glanced downward and had the disconcerting experience of looking through where he knew his torso and legs to be and seeing the imprint of his boots in the dirt below. Now for the difficult part, he thought. Going to the rear of the tent, he slit the taut fabric with his hunting knife and slipped through the opening, sleek as a well-fed cat. Bloodgarm was waiting for him outside. He inclined his head in the general direction of Aragon and murmured, Shade Slayer, then devoted his attention to mending the hole, which he did with a half dozen short words in the ancient language. So he basically has an invisibility cloak. (laughs) (laughs) 
I also love that he like snuck out his bedroom window basically. Yeah. Like he's fucking 12. Weeb. <laughs> <laughs> Aragon drifted down the path between two rows of tents, using his knowledge of woodcraft to make as little noise as possible. Whenever anyone approached, Aragon darted off the path and stood motionless, hoping they would not notice the footprints of shadow and the dirt on the grass. He cursed the fact that the land was so dry, his boots tended to raise small puffs of dust no matter how gently he lowered them. To his surprise, being invisible degraded his sense of balance. Without the ability to see where his hands or feet were, he kept misjudging distances and bumping into things, almost as if he had consumed too much ale. Despite his uncertain progress, he reached the edge of the camp in fairly good time and without arousing any suspicion. He paused behind a rain barrel, hiding his footprints in the thick shadow, and studied the packed earth ramparts and ditches lined with sharpened stakes that protected the Varden's eastern flank. If he had been trying to enter the camp, it would have been extremely difficult to escape detection by any one of the... by any one... by... who? yeah. Get it. If he had been trying to enter the camp, it would have been extremely difficult to escape detection by one of the many sentinels who patrolled the ramparts, even while invisible. But since the trenches and the ramparts were designed to repel attackers and not imprison the defenders, crossing them from the opposite direction was a far easier task. Aragon waited until the two closest sentinels had their backs turned toward him. Then he sprinted forward, pumping his arms with all his might. Within seconds, he traversed the hundred or so feet that separated the rain barrel from the slope of the rampart and dashed up the embankment so fast, he felt as if he were a stone skipping across water. At the crest of the embankment, he drove his legs into the ground, arms flailing. He drove his legs into the ground and, arms flailing, leaped out over the lines of the Varden's defenses. For three silent heartbeats, he flew, then landed with a bone-jarring impact. As soon as he regained his balance, Aragon pressed himself flat against the ground and held his breath. One of the sentinels paused in his rounds, but he did not seem to notice anything out of the ordinary, and after a moment he resumed his pacing. Aragon released his breath and whispered, Du de l'oeil le nez, du de and felt as a... S- <laughs> felt as a Swedish boy. <laughs> and felt as a spell smoothed out the impressions his boots had left in the embankment. Still invisible... He stood and trotted away from the camp, careful t- to step only on clumps of grass so he would not kick up more dust. The farther he got from the sentinels, the faster he ran, until he sped over the land more quickly than a galloping horse. Almost an hour later, he danced down the steep side of a narrow draw that the wind and rain had etched into the surface of the grasslands. At the bottom was a trickle of water lined with rushes and cattails. He continued downstream, staying well away from the soft ground next to the water in an attempt to avoid leaving traces of his passage <clears throat> until the creek widened into a small pond and there by the edge he saw the bulk of a bare-chested coal sitting on a boulder i feel like you could like have a spell and it would like consistently drain energy from you mm-hmm. but it would be like a little tiny bit of energy like it wouldn't be a lot that would always cover your track yeah he probably could have done that but he didn't think about it and I feel like that, that wouldn't take a lot of energy because it would be like as soon as like your foot would move from the imprint, it would just like cover it up. Mm-hmm. And so it would be it wouldn't be like a distant spell. It would be like cover my tracks like after I make them. And so it would be like you would never make a track. Right. Also, I feel like stepping on the clumps of grass would almost be like more obvious than just like dust being like kicked up because it could just be like a little boof of like wind. A little or boof. A little a <laughs> boof of <laughs> Not wind. Not a boof of wind. <laughs> but like. You know, like a little, like, gust of wind that could have kicked up dust. But, like, if you're smashing down the grass, like, that's weird. Yeah, you just see, like, grass being, like... (laughs) (laughs) Like, in, like, footsteps. But then if you saw, like, dust and you're like, oh, I'm going to go inspect that. Yeah. And you're covering your tracks, like, as you're running through. Then you're like, oh, was this the wind fucking kicking up dust? But if you're like, oh, I'm going to go inspect that. And you go and there's, like, broken stalks of grass and, like, a trail. Yeah, like, could have been, like, oh, that could have been just, like, a small animal. What do we know? We're not Aragon and... Have his I'm masterfuls. not a dragon rider. Yeah. As Aragon pushed his way through a stand of cattails, the sound of rustling leaves and stalks alerted the cold of his presence. The creature turned his massive horned head toward Aragon, <clears throat> sniffing at the air. It was Narg Osvog, leader of the Urgols who had allied themselves with the Varden. Wow, that must be quite the honor then. You! exclaimed Aragon, becoming visible once more. Greetings, fire sword. Garsvog rumbled, heaving up his thick limbs and giant torso. The Urgul rose to his full eight and a half feet, his gray-skinned muscles rippling in the light of the noonday sun. 
Greetings, Nar... Greetings, Nar Goswag, said Aragon. Confused, he asked, What of your rams? Who will lead them if you go with me? My blood brother, Skogsgrez. Skogrez. Mm. My blood brother, Skogrez, will lead. He is not Cole, but he has long horns and a thick neck. He is a fine war chief. I see. Why did you want to come, though? Thurgo lifted his square chin, baring his throat. You are fire sword. You must not die, or the Earl Galgra, the Urgals as you name us, will not have a revenge against Galbatorx, and our race will die in this land. Therefore I will run with you. I am the best of our fighters. I have defeated forty-two rams in single combat. Aragon nodded, not displeased by the turn of events. Of all the Urgals, he trusted Garzvog the most, for he had probed the Kul's consciousness before the Battle of the Burning Plains, and had discovered that by the standards of his race, Garzvog was honest and reliable. As long as, it is, as long as he doesn't decide that his honor requires him to challenge me to a duel, we should have no cause for conflict. <clears throat> don't piss him off, then. Right? Don't fucking be a racist. Yeah, like, don't be a dick. Very well, Nargoswag, he said, tightening the strap of the pack around his waist. Let us run together, you and I, as has not happened in the whole of recorded history. Garsvog chuckled deep in his throat. Th Whoa, what the fuck? Throst? What the fuck is a throst? Whatever Urgles have. Garsvog chuckled deep in his chest. <laughs> Fucking weeb. <laughs> Let us run, fire sword. Let us run, little weeb boy. <laughs> Let us run, little weeb boy. <laughs> little mousy weeb boy. <laughs> together they faced east, and together they set forth for the Bure Mountains. Aragon running light and swift, swift and Garsvog loping beside him, taking one stride for every two of Aragons, the earth shuddering beneath the burden of his weight. Above them, swollen thunderheads gathered along the horizon, pretend, portending a torrential storm, and circling hawks uttered lonesome, lonesome cries as they hunted their prey. Wow. Fucking weeaboo. So I can't wait for Aragon to say a genuinely racist thing about Urgles <laughs> and then Nargar to, an er to him yeah to the leader and then for Nargar Nar 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 Nargosvog Nargos do you need to see how it's spelled yeah Nargos Garsvog Nargosvog Nargosvog God <laughs> I keep wanting to add like an look Nargarsvog 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 Nargars Vog. Nargars Vog. Okay, anyway, I can't wait for Aragon to piss him off. And then he's like, You don't understand, you stupid little weeb. weeb. <laughs> and he goes, Fine, I pull my rams out of your battle. Like, I just can't. And then he just runs away. <laughs> just leaves Aragon by himself. And he's like, <laughs> 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 Exactly like that. Just like that. Because, like, because I know people like to throw, like, the word racist around a lot. But, like, Aragon's character, like, is truly racist. Like, he has hate in his heart for the Urgle race. Yeah. And so it, it'll be interesting to see. Because, obviously, like, Aragon doesn't, re like, main, remain a racist. Right. It'll, it'll be interesting to see how his prejudice abates just yeah. by just by spending time with mm -hmm. what he doesn't understand and i mean wow. like i mean if that's not a commentary on <laughs> the racism as a whole i don't know, I know what it's the like, fuck is wow if you just fucking take time to understand another person and how they're different it's not even like yeah it's not even it's just like literally having a presence of mind so not having a dog brain right wow Freya, you racist? <laughs> <laughs> they are though. I mean, they're kind. Of, I mean, Freya did really prefer Japanese people to white people, and also they prefer huskies. They do also prefer huskies. Like, it's funny. Like, if they're at the dog park and there's like, uh, like two other huskies there, and the rest of the dogs are like labs or whatever, yeah, or like chihuahuas other, or something, normal, like breeds. they will go to the huskies, and the huskies will like pack up and pack out. Yeah. And there'll be like a little whirlwind of huskies <laughs> and just leave the other dogs to themselves. It's, it's hilarious. So bizarre. Because like it's weird to think of dogs like even 
like, do they sense it? Are they consciously aware? Like, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't think they're conscious at all. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, um, like Isaac will growl at other dogs, but not Huskies. Like a Husky can come up to him, teeth bared, and he'll just like joke around. Mm -hmm. But also Dobermans, he's fine with just because he grew up around Doberman. Yeah, that's true. But like a Labrador, like he'll fucking straight up growl at Labradors and they're like some of the nicest dogs. Well, sometimes, but yeah. most of the time, like labs are like the nicest dogs and he'll fucking straight up growl at a Labrador. But a Husky will come up like teeth bearing and he'll just be like. <laughs> you know what? I've never like noticed that he's shows more aggression towards like not Husky breeds. He does because he's fucking. What little racist dogs. Look at her little fucking doing? having a racist dream. I can't believe we have such racist children. <laughs> <laughs> Ver Versk. 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 <laughs> Versk is saying it's probably because Huskies are insane and they all know it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay, back to the back to what we just read. That's it. <laughs> you got any thoughts? <laughs> I don't think anything. <laughs> Um, I'm just really like, I don't know. This chapter was just kind of like Aragon's sad to leave and wow. And now he has an invisibility cloak and all of a sudden he's Harry Potter. But I don't know. I'm just like excited to see him like grow as a character. Cause like you can see it coming from a mile away mm -hmm. and I can't wait to learn more about the Urgles because we like started to learn about them at the beginning of this book. And like now it's like, or was it the last book? It was the last book, whatever. Fucking sometime we learned about them. And it's interesting to like, what I feel like they're an interesting like race. It's not just like, ooh, elves and dwarves and humans. Yeah, because we learned, they're like more relatable to like an orc. Yeah. But like, not like Lord of the Rings orcs where they're kind of like just fucking stupid and shitty. But it's more like, I feel like it's more like a Warcraft orc where they have like history and yeah. like, like challenges and they like they, they, they're, they're like seem like they, they would be like super violent and crazy, but they're like mm -hmm. more shamanistic and like earthy yeah. than you would like expect. <clears throat> and that you only have like such a bad image in your mind of them because of like the violence that you see them. Right. Cause of your like, you're only shown them through like a certain viewpoint or a point of view. Um, they remind me of, oh my God, the braid people. They got the braids and the horses. Khaleesi. Dothraki. Dothraki. That's what they're fucking called. Holy shit. Um, but th they kind of remind me more of like that, like group of people just because they're very like, like, a violent centric people. Um, and that like, they're like, Ooh, like the biggest horns were like the Dothraki. It's like the longest braid yeah. kind of a deal. I don't know. That's kind of what they remind me of. And I think it's cool. <clears throat> and I'm interested to learn about like their beliefs and like how they like live their lives. Also like going back to previous chapters that like Ormus picked up on Aragon's prejudice and was like, you need to learn about the mm -hmm. coal. You never know. Like, one day they yeah. might become your allies, like fucking Ormus knew. Yeah. I mean, like, Ormus probably saw that, like, everybody's going to have to band together at some point to mm -hmm. defeat Galpatorix, and, like, it's only a matter of time, like, right. really, before the Urkels come around, or they don't, but they might. Chances are they will. And so, had Aragon learn about him, and he's able, and I like that in the last book, he was able to, like, tell Nasawada, like, these things, like, oh, they're bearing the throat as a sign of, like, submission. Mm -hmm. They're lowering their head as a sign of, like, challenge. Like, he's able to, like, provide these inf this information, but he still, like, has this prejudice. And so now he has an understanding of them as a people, and now he's going to get to know one as, like, an individual, as a person. Right. And it's just, it's going to be interesting to see how he comes out of his, like, prejudice and his racism. Like, whereas he might not necessarily agree with the way that they live their life, he can, like, understand it and mm -hmm. have the presence of mind to, to not hate it. Yeah. Because the thing to, like, the way to, like, mitigate hate is to just understand and to gain perspective. And so yeah. him gaining that perspective is going to be something really cool to, like, read about and discuss. I'm excited about it. Because it has a it has a bit of a commentary on, 
like racism mm-hmm. in humanity. Yeah. Like in real life. Like IRL. In IRL non weeb land. <laughs> I'm always in weeb land. <laughs> Mashi day. <laughs> Wait, do I mean that seriously as in like <laughs> serious about it or seriously as in seriously do you mean that? I think that all is just the same. Majide. Majide. Dude, who fucking cares how I mean it? Yeah, bye. <laughs> yeah, bye. <laughs> <clears throat> and Gabe is asking, what is Dothraki? It's a. Uh, uh, from Game of Thrones land. It's what um, called Drogo was. Yeah, it's like the. They're seen as like these. Tribe is pe- tribe yeah, of like people. Tribal, like simpleton kind of people. But it's like a whole, they're like a nomadic people that just like travel around and horses and grasslands and. Grass horses. <laughs> Anything else about this chapter? Oh, he was sucking energy from cows and shit. Oh, yeah. We were, we were talking about that in a previous chapter, and I'm pretty sure that there were some comments of people saying, like, no, he can't do that because it's a secret. He can't, he can't suck energy from cows and stuff. Or, like, because he's the... Uh, people were, like, complaining about it. About, like, us saying that he could, he could have done that. He could do that. And then he goes and does it. Why is it a secret? I thought we learned that from Ormus and the his the shrub slayer thing. <clears throat> well, um, like Ormus said to keep it a secret because Galvatorix might not know about it. Got, he was like saying like it might be our greatest greatest weapon against Galvatorix. He might not even know about how to suck up energy from other things or whatever. But it's like he's especially with like events that f- unfold later. Like there is no fucking way he doesn't know about it. I just feel like. Um, Galbator, like, I just feel like f- I don't know anything about anything, but like Galbatorx is too strong and he's been alive for too long to not. Like he's had so many fucking years to like play around with magic and energy and he's like done things like he's literally trans. Okay. So he's transferring energy into Thorn to make him stronger. Mm-hmm. Obviously that's yeah. pretty apparent by one means of another, by one means or another, that's what he's doing. And then to say like, that it might be a secret from him that you can transfer energy into like gems or whatever, or transfer energy from other sources or use energy from other sources. That it might be a secret. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I don't really think so. Well, and then it's like, okay, sure. Like he needs to like keep it a secret or like whatever, but it's not like he's killing animals and like, he's not like out there, like killing a herd of deer. He's where they're butchering animals already that are already being killed and he's sucking their energy, which is kind of like discreet. He's not killing the animals like they don't know what he's doing there. And he's kind of there under the guise of his dragon needs to eat. So while she's there eating this animal, he's just kind of like hanging out, sucking up the energy as the animals die. Mm -hmm. So like it's not obvious what he's doing. And it's not, like, against, yeah, it's not, like, revealing a secret, but also it's, like, not against, like, his morals. Yeah, like, the animal was already going to die, and so, like... And, like, that's exactly what we had, like, proposed in a previous episode was he could just go to the slaughterhouse and just suck up the energy. Well, yeah, because, like, I don't know, because to me, like, that makes the most sense. Like, you might as well use up the animal in its entirety and like maybe it's you know sacrifice wasn't in vain whereas you could just let it fucking die i guess i don't know i do also like though that it had an actual effect on him and it shows that his morality that his morality is getting in the way from him just sitting there like all fucking day and sucking up like every animal that they kill that he had to stop and so it does show that it is like a a moral thing Mm -hmm. that stops him from doing that and not necessarily the inability to do it or whatever yeah, I like that he showed me. But he still does it because out of yeah. necessity. But it was like a nice like show, don't tell. Yep, I agree. Appreciate Very, it. that was like, I, I've like definitely noticed his writing has been getting a lot better the deeper we get into yeah. the book. There's He's still like me. some like random things that he describes. I'm like, okay, I don't care. Like, don't I need don't... to describe it. Like I've started reading, I finished House of Leaves and that was just like a super descriptive book just because like it had to be. Mm-hmm. But then I started reading Inferno and like, that's not descriptive like at all, but you still get the gist of everything. Mm -hmm. JD would be proud. Looking at you, JD, I've (laughs) been reading Inferno. Thank you everyone so much for watching. Special thanks 
special shout out thanks to our patrons, patreons, patrons, whatever. Join our Patreon, become one today. Join in on the recording room fun. It's like you're looking in through a window. As Kelly describes it, it's like you're looking in through a window and like watching us like record or something, but I there's mean, no window. You're just listening. Yes, so you're like I mean, you're like holding your hand <laughs> you're holding your ear up to one of those like cans attached to a string that's into the recording room before it ever even posts. It's like you get to listen to it live and all of our stupid mistakes live, unedited. And then you also get to listen to it if you miss the recording sesh on Patreon before it posts on YouTube. So that's like a double Benny. Whoa. And then a triple Benny is you get to be on the in on the know before anyone else does. So you can go to fucking YouTube and be like, I knew this was happening before it fucking happened because Page. I'm a Patreon. Patron. 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 A patron is like a robot or something. Could be a patron too. <laughs> or a matron. Hmm. But anyway, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you in the next one. <laughs> that grossed <laughs> me out. <laughs> um, wow, I'm so excited for the journey because I was really worried it was just going to be fucking Aragon just running, just Naruto running all the well, way to the, the door. You knew that there was going to be a coal with them. Well, yeah, but like.